Well, good evening. Uh, it's lovely to have you gathered with us. If you're a visitor and perhaps watching for the first time, a particular welcome to you. My name's Pete Harrison, the pastor at the chapel, and uh, it's lovely to be able to worship on Good Friday, worship God as we remember what he did through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, uh, it's lovely to be gathered with you. We're going to open by seeing a lovely hymn, one of my own favourites, which is called Beneath the Cross of Jesus. speaking of the rest and security and refuge we find in Jesus and in the cross on that final day when God comes to judge uh, the whole earth. Well let's come to pray. Uh, we as Christians love to pray and we have so much to praise God for so let's let's worship him. Oh Father I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your mercy to me. I want to thank you Lord that uh, though I was once a, a man who just had love for myself and uh, love for my own ways, Lord, I thank you that you sent another man into this world. Uh, the one, Lord, who succeeded where every one of us have failed. The one who was sinless and spotless, the Son of God. Father, I want to thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We thank you that his name is Jesus, which means God saves. He will save his people from their sins. And Father, we thank you that in your love for this world that has broken your laws, that even when it sees the consequences of our own ways, when we see society breaking down, Lord, when we see families splitting and breaking up, when we see relationships that are harmed, Lord, when we see uh, politics, Lord, that forgets you and begins to unravel uh, and has no answers, Lord, we thank you that your mercies never fail. We thank you that every day that as a Christian, oh, we can wake up and we can say his mercy endures forever. His goodness has been with us. And even in the hardest of times, even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we need fear no evil, for you are with us. Lord, we thank you that Jesus is the good shepherd. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that as a good shepherd, he laid down his life to save his people. We thank you, Lord, that he went to that cross as we celebrate on Good Friday. Good, because we see the goodness of God given to, to mankind that is unworthy and undeserving. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the friend of sinners. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are full of gentleness and meekness, as well as being one with great authority. As you came and people realised, here was a dynamic man who was God, a man who you cannot sit on the fence with. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the immense gift of love in your dear Son the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the cross, which is the refuge and the place of safety on that day of judgment. Thank you that Jesus died so that we can have eternal life. What a message, what a good news, what a gospel. Thank you, Lord. Forgive all my sin and help me now to lead this time of worship in a way that pleases you above all. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, it's lovely to be able to uh, do this for the children as well. And uh, children are precious to God. He made them all. And uh, those of you who I know, who I'd normally see at chapel, um, I'm looking forward to seeing you all again. Well, we sang in that hymn about two things that we were singing about the wonder of our unworthiness and the greatness of his love. I don't know if you know, but was Jesus crucified alone? No, you're right. He had two people, one on either side, crucified with him. Do any of you know why they were being crucified? That's right, they were thieves. And when Jesus was first put on the cross, which was at nine o'clock in the morning, both of those thieves were full of laughter. Even in their pain, even as they were suffering, nailed to the, their crosses, they were laughing at Jesus. They were joining in with the crowd. And you know, boys and girls, I was once like that. I can't say I ever laughed at Jesus, but I didn't love him. And I didn't care for him. And you know, I was just like those, those two thieves. You see, I've been a thief many times. When I was a little boy and I would go home from Thurlison Primary School for my, for my lunch. And maybe this is the first time anyone's heard of this. We would be given a chocolate bar like a Kit Kat. And I remember I had a sweet tooth and I ate too much. And I used to take more than one. Sometimes I'd take three and eat them in the garden where no one could see. That was stealing. Do you remember one of God's great commandments? You shall not steal. Well, not only did I do that, but I've actually told Nigel, who you know, or, or my dad about this now, but there were times when I used to go into his wallet and steal some money so that I could go and buy sweets at the shop or stickers in the Rugby World Cup sticker book. I remember it so well. Well, not only did I steal things like that, but I used to be unkind. In fact, maybe some of my friends are watching this now and they knew that I could be proud and horrible when I played football. I would foul people and hurt them. I've hurt many people in my life. And you know, you say, well, is that stealing? Well, yes, it is, because you're stealing their happiness. And sometimes we steal the truth. And I, I couldn't tell you how many times I've stolen the truth and got other people in trouble. But you know, there came a day where just like one of those thieves on the cross who, after a few hours, began to see that Jesus was different, 
even though he was crucified and he, was, he had blood on him and he was crowned with thorns and everyone was laughing at him, the thief realised that he wasn't just an ordinary man, but that Jesus was the Son of God. And that he wasn't dying because he was bad, he was dying because of our sin. Well, that thief, he cried out to Jesus with the last breaths that he had and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, what do you think Jesus would say? What would you say if it was your, your wrongdoing or someone else had done wrong to you and you got in trouble for it? Jesus turned to that man and he said, I promise you, I tell you the truth, you'll be with me in heaven today. Wow! Wow! That man couldn't put everything right. He couldn't give back what he'd stolen. But he said to God, I am a sinner. I've got it wrong. But Jesus hasn't. And I trust that Jesus has taken my punishment. And Jesus gave him a promise, even as he was dying on the cross. You'll be with me in heaven today. Well, I wonder, boys and girls, for me, I was, I was in my 20s. I was older than you before I really understood who Jesus was for me personally and how all of my stealing and lying has gone away because he's taken it and paid for it on the cross. Well, how about you? Well, we're going to read from God's Word and uh, I'd like to turn to John's Gospel. John was one of Jesus' disciples and an eyewitness of Jesus and he wrote this so that we might know ourselves that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing in him we might be saved. And I want to read from John chapter 18 and verse 28. And this is when Jesus is now being brought before Pontius Pilate. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. And it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe, and they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man! Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I, I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, 
because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid. And went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. Well, hopefully I pray that God will speak to us all um, through, through his word. We're now going to just listen to Susanna and Esther who are going to sing a lovely old hymn called Man of Sorrows, What a Name. <laughs> to you as you heard those words let's just pray heavenly father we thank you for jesus the man of sorrows what a name for the son of god who came ruined sinners to reclaim hallelujah what a savior thank you jesus for loving me lord i pray that you would speak to us all now by your spirit open eyes help those to be of the truth hearing the voice of jesus now in in your word. Oh Father, hear our prayer because of Jesus. Amen. Well, I want us to think about Pontius Pilate for uh, just a few minutes. Uh, in Isaiah 52, uh, Isaiah was a prophet who lived 
uh, around 700 years before the Lord Jesus was born. Uh, there's a lot of the things that he said about Jesus. Some of them would be familiar to you at Christmas time. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He spoke about Emmanuel, the Messiah being God with us. Um, but Isaiah wrote this in, in chapter 52. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Now we think of this man, Pontius Pilate. Number one, he wasn't a Christian. And number two, he wasn't a Jew. He was a Roman governor. In fact, he was a man who hated the Jews. He was a brutal man. When there had been an insurrection in the kingdom, the province that he was over in the Roman Empire, he'd gone so far as to take some of the people, murdering them and mixing their blood on the altar of sacrifice, which for a Jew was sacrilege and blasphemous. Here was a man who hated these people. They were nothing to him. Jerusalem and Judea was a backwater of the Roman Empire. And in one sense, you could describe um, in his way of thinking that Pontius Pilate saw himself as a bit of a, a backbencher who was unloved and unwanted and uh, wanted to be a far away from those who sat on the front bench of government and Caesar himself. He didn't want to be here, put it like that. And on this morning, and it was early on in the morning, the religious leaders bring Jesus after a night of trial and the first thing is that Pontius Pilate is a witness to their hypocrisy and to their irony. They talk about their law. And what's sad is that they tried Jesus through the night. That was against God's law. They paid false witnesses. They deceived and committed perjury. And they had rejected the truth that they knew was in Jesus. You see, these Pharisees, Sadducees, as they were called... These religious hypocrites, they were men uh, and women who would have been high up, as it were, in the echelons of society. And they'd seen his miracles. They'd heard his words. They'd seen his compassion and his love. And they'd rejected him. And the irony is that they didn't want to go into the Gentile praetorium, the palace of the governor, because they wanted to take part in this special Passover feast that represented God's salvation from Israel's slavery in Egypt. Their freedom, as it were. And they were saying, we want to worship God and, and enjoy this freedom. When actually, they were people who were just like Pharaoh thousands of years before, enslaving those who were pursuing God, putting burdens on the people. No, there was an irony and a hypocrisy about them here. Well, Pontius Pilate goes back into the praetorium and he sees before him a pulpy mess of a man. Jesus had spent the whole night being beaten. He'd had a, a, a bag or a, a, a bag put over him and he'd been beaten. They'd been mocking him saying, if you're really a prophet, tell us who struck you. In fact, the Bible said in Isaiah 53 that his visage, his form would be marred more than any man. But he was also, in Pontius Pilate's eyes, a pathetic nobody. Again, in Isaiah 53, Jesus is described as a, a tender plant. He, he wouldn't have cut a William Wallace figure, all big and muscular and the Hollywood hero. no. No, he would look like an ordinary man. He was described as a root out of dry ground. I described Jerusalem as, as a backwater to the Roman Empire. Well, Jesus was from Nazareth. That's like the trailer trash of the backwater. Can anything good come from Nazareth? You know, in Pontius Pilate's mind, here's this man, Jesus. He's not a Roman. He's not a Greek. He's not a great philosopher from the East. He's a nobody. Who is this man? You know, there are many people today who have that opinion. You think of all the great universities around the world, most of which were based 
and built up by men and women who feared God and who believed the Bible and who had faith in Jesus Christ. Yale, Princeton, Oxford, Cambridge, all these great universities that were built on the knowledge of God and the pursuit of real science. You go there today and you mention the name Jesus and you'll hear sniggering or outright laughing. No, Jesus is mocked and forgotten and yet this was all God's plan. You see, God's word says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise, God says? Where is the teacher? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. Here's the Lord Jesus. And here's the representative of the might of Rome. Jesus, sorry, Pontius Pilate, hears the accusations against him. What is it? Why have you brought this man? Judge him according to your law. I haven't got time for this. Perhaps some of you today who are watching this and you're not Christians and Easter is a, a distraction. The thought of maybe coming on YouTube and, and hearing a message about Jesus Christ is it's almost irrelevant in your minds and in your hearts and in your plans for the future. Well, these people say, if he was not an evildoer, we wouldn't have brought him. They're pointing the finger and saying, this man, he's a wicked man. But let's look at the evidence, like good interrogators. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. Jesus was there at the graveside of two ladies, Mary and Martha, when their brother had died, Lazarus. He wept with them. The Bible describes him as full of compassion. So many times it says, and Jesus, looking on the people, was filled with compassion. He was full of mercy. He was sacrificial with his time and his energy. He was full of forgiveness. He was fearless to tackle hypocrisy and hate and oppression. You know, Jesus was the greatest champion of freedom. The greatest champion of, of liberties and equality. He did good to those who hated him and he loved his enemies. You know, for many people who say we don't want Jesus, we don't want his teachings, we don't want Christianity in society. Well, the problem is then you get rid of the, the greatest principle of all. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbour as yourself. And who is my neighbour? Jesus said it's your worst enemy. Do them good. And yet with this evidence, their judgment and their conclusion is, he must die. You know, have you ever asked the question, why? If Jesus was so good, so pure, why did he attract such hatred? The reason is because Jesus is light. I am the light of the world, he said. And when he was talking to a man who was another religious leader, but who had an honest heart, and he came to Jesus at night, and Jesus said, Nicodemus... Unless you're born again from God's Spirit, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven, let alone be in it. They're the words of Jesus himself. And he went on to say this. He said, the Son of Man, that was him, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. You see, the world is already condemned. You see, you and I are already in, in darkness, the darkness of our own sin, the darkness of our own selfish ways, the darkness that is outside of God's light. And Jesus, like a searchlight, comes into this world, who is the light of the world, and just like when we know there's wrong, and light begins to be shed on it, we want to either run away, or we come humbly confessing. You see, most of the world wants to run away from Jesus. And most of the world wants to put Jesus on the cross in their lives and say, away with you, because you're light. And I either have to deal with the darkness or I have to deal with the light. Well, Pontius Pilate, as though he was a, 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 a man who had no time for sympathy, 
Yet he keeps finding in Jesus no fault. No fault. No fault. In fact, he does his very best to release Jesus. The first time he comes and he says, well, we have a tradition at the Passover feast to celebrate it. I let free a prisoner. Who do you want? Do you want Jesus, the king of the Jews? Or, or do you want Barabbas, this, this robber, this rebel, this murderer? But they cry out, crucify Jesus, give us Barabbas. Anyone but Jesus. Pilate then, here's, here's his next method. I'll put Jesus' purity into the furnace. I'll test him, I'll scourge him, I'll crown him with thorns. I'll get my soldiers, the whole garrison, to line him up and to mock him and to beat him. And to break him down. And then we'll see if there's any wrong in him. And he, he presents Jesus and he says, look, I'm going to bring him out to you so that you can see that there's nothing wrong with this man. And as Jesus is brought out more bloody than before, crucify him, crucify him, they're crying. For the third time, I find no fault in him. You crucify him. Now you imagine if in our law courts today, imagine if we illustrated in that same way and say, if this was to happen today, it never would have got to court. It never would have got to trial. All of the evidence, all of the character statements, all of the eyewitness accounts say, here was a man who was full of love and truth. Here was a man who was unblemished and spotless. And Pontius Pilate could see that. And I wonder if you've ever read any of the Gospels, if you've ever read about Jesus. I challenge you to do that at this Easter time and try and see if this man is really who he said he was. And see his record. And you'll be like Pontius Pilate. The first discovery he made was this man was a perfect man. Not like me. Not like you. He was a perfect man. The second discovery that Pontius Pilate very quickly made is that Jesus is the king. Is the king. Now let's remember here, we're not talking about a fairy story. We're talking about the Roman Empire. We're talking about a real governor from history. And we're talking about a real figure who stands before him. And he says to Jesus, are you a king? You say rightly that I am a king. Jesus' answer unnerves Pilate. Why are you asking this, Jesus says. Is it because you're interested or because someone else has told you concerning me? Jesus is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the eternal God. He's the sovereign of heaven and earth. He is the King of a spiritual kingdom. I won't go into all the prophecies of the Bible, but one of them would be wonderful for you to look for yourself in the, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And one of the great kings saw a vision of empires, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, long before the, 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 the last three had ever come. And then he saw a rock that was cut out without man's hands. It was God's work. And that rock pushed aside all those kingdoms and became a mountain that filled the earth. Have you ever wondered why Christianity, though it has been crushed and persecuted so many times, and yet you see all around the world millions following Jesus Christ? His kingdom is not of this world, but one day it will be. You see, the king has promised to return for his people. He's promised to come and make all things new, where there'll be no more disease or suffering or death or dying. He's the prince of peace. And as a Christian, I can know that peace now, and I do. But peace of the future as well. Peace for eternity. Jesus is a king. The third discovery that Pontius Pilate makes is that Jesus is the voice of truth. Most of you would remember the Second Gulf War, when we and America and some other allies went into, in, into the Middle East, into Iraq, because of weapons of mass destruction. Now, I'm not being political here, but what I'm saying is that there was a claim 
and investigators were sent in. Well, the Lord Jesus says to Pontius Pilate, he said, I've come into this world for this cause, to bear witness to the truth, to the truth. We live in a world which is no different to Pontius Pilate's world. I, I don't wear a toga and a breastplate, okay? We don't uh, go around in chariots on cobbled roads anymore. But we live in a world that has changing opinions all the time. Political parties claiming sole ownership of wisdom. Cultural fluxes, fraud in business, cheating on tax returns, whimsical lying like it doesn't matter, deceit in relationships, fake news, photoshopped images of ourselves, not just physically, but we like to give the good appearance to those who meet us. But Jesus comes in and he is an investigator of all falsehood in the world and in us. He is a bearer of truth. You see, God is truth. And Jesus said just earlier in John's Gospel, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You know what this world needs today? It needs something solid. It needs a concrete foundation that will never move. It needs an anchor for our souls and our minds and our hearts. Do you know who that anchor is? It's Jesus Christ. And I know that because he's my anchor. And he's proven himself for the past, for today. And if I die today, no fear for the future. Only hope. That's what our families need. That's what societies need. That's what the younger generation needs. It needs something solid, not something fluid. It needs the truth of God. And you see, Pilate was troubled by this truth. In verse 38 of the chapter 18, it, he tries to change the subject. You see, Jesus unnerves people. He unnerved Pontius Pilate. I came for this cause, to bring the truth. And he said, those who are of the truth hear my voice. Are you hearing the voice of Jesus today? Can you hear in your spirit, this man is truth? See, Pontius Pilate couldn't deal with that. He didn't want to deal with that truth. And so he says, well, what is truth? Well, that's a silly question, isn't it? We all know what truth really is. There's a thousand different definitions, but truth is two and two equals four. And truth is Jesus Christ. He then discovered as well that Jesus is the Son of God. This is where Pontius Pilate really began to sweat. The third time when he said, I find no fault in him. And these, these people who've rejected their Saviour and their Messiah are screaming for his death. And they say, this is why, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pontius Pilate heard those words, it says he was afraid. He was afraid. Isn't this interesting? Here's a man who hasn't sat down in a church or a chapel all his life. He's a pagan. Here's a man who lives just, just to please himself, to eat, drink and to be merry. And yet here before him is standing not, not a man in a great toga with a laurel wreath around his head, not a king on, on a steed riding before great armies. Here is the epitome of weakness. And yet the Son of God. You know, C.S. Lewis, the great writer, author and philosopher, he said, Jesus is either bad, mad, or the Son of God, who he said he was. Was he bad? Was he mad? No. He is our creator. He is the one who was there in the beginning. And, and when I have to say this, and when Darwinianism and uh, theistic evolution and uh, those things that, that there is no evidence for, when, when they begin to catch up with the reality that life comes from life and all the DNA comes with, with masses of information that couldn't have been put there other than by a sovereign almighty God, people will realise God is God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus hadn't struck Pontius Pilate with lightning to prove this. 
God's Holy Spirit was challenging Pilate. But you know, the last discovery that, that, Pilate, that Pilate made with Jesus is that it wasn't him that held the power. It was Jesus. Don't, aren't you afraid, Jesus? I have the power to nail you to a cross. Jesus says, you have no power except it be given you from above. The time came for judgment. Pilate knew that Jesus was the truth. Pilate believed it. He couldn't argue with it. But sadly, Pontius Pilate feared men. He feared their opinions. He feared what they would do to him if he, if he did the right thing. He feared Caesar and he wanted Caesar's favour when they said, look, you're not a friend of Caesar if you let him go. He loved his position, his power, his possessions. And he knew that to follow Jesus would mean death to himself and death to this world. And he made his choice. He knew the truth. But he loved this life more. He loved himself more. And he didn't want to come to the truth. And Pontius Pilate condemned Jesus and he washed his hands. Trying to wash away the stain of his disobedience. Of what he knew was wrong. And you know that's what we try and do with our sin. If we don't deal with it through Jesus. We try and deal with God. We try and get clean. We try and say no I'm okay. In a thousand different ways. And none of it works. I tried it. No, the last thing that Pontius Pilate should have discovered but didn't is that Jesus came to save sinners like Pontius Pilate, like me and like you. You know why I'm so happy at Easter time? It's because God loved me and he sent his son to die for me. When Jesus went to that cross and Pontius Pilate didn't go that way, he stayed at the judgment seat. He'd made his decision. And Jesus was nailed to the cross. And Pilate didn't see that. And Pilate didn't see the one who was paying for his sin. He didn't see his blood that washes away sin. Because it shows that the penalty is paid. That life has been forfeited. And the sacrifice has been made in our place. See the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could be made the righteousness, the perfection of God. So that we could have forgiveness of sins. So that we could now be at peace with God and in a relationship with God that we can't have because of our sin because God is good and God is pure. But it's God who reaches to you and me. It's God who comes in the person of his own Son. And says to us, the truth is you are a sinner. The truth is you've let others down and you've not loved me. And the truth is one day there is a judgment. And there is a penalty for sin. But Jesus Christ has come and taken that penalty. And he gives to us instead all of God's riches. All of God's goodness. God's eternal life. And a living hope of being in his kingdom forever. I wonder, are we going to finish Good Friday like Pontius Pilate, going to bed, knowing that we're not right with God, knowing that there is wrong in our hearts we know is there, but we don't want to deal with it, and not knowing that peace, and not knowing that if we die today and we stand before God, as we will all do, not knowing that we'll be in his kingdom forever, but instead separated from him forever. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He who lives and believes in me will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Isn't that wonderful? It's a free gift of God, and it's offered to you today. If you'll turn from your sin, and you'll believe on Jesus Christ as your saviour. Well, I'll leave it there. If anyone wants to ask more questions, do email, do contact. And I'd love to, to talk to you and answer your questions. 
Well, let's just sing our last song. It's a wonderful song about the Saviour. And sinner's place. Thank you Lord for loving us and for showing us that mercy and thank you Jesus that in love for those who had put you on that cross you died in our place and you pray Father forgive them for they know not what they do. Thank you Lord. Thank you in Jesus name. Amen. God bless. <laughs>